Right. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Mihai, for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be back in Manchester, uh, especially with the post-crash uh, economic society. I think I gave one of the first uh, lectures organized by the society back in 2011 or 12. And yeah, I mean, I'm grateful for the great work uh, that the society has been doing. I that, uh, really thank you all for coming on this uh, cold day. You know, I wouldn't have come. I would have uh, watched uh, my Netflix. <laughs> but uh, here you are. I'm really grateful. So let me begin. You know, Manchester is uh, one of the places where development economics started, you know, the legacy of Arthur Lewis and uh, one of the earliest uh, development studies programs in the country. Development economics as uh, it used to be understood emerged as a separate branch of economics in the 1940s and 50s on the recognition that the differences in economic and non-economic structures make it necessary to apply different economic theories to different countries. So for example, the, you know, many early development economists, including Arthur Lewis himself, argue that a lot of economic problems experienced by developing countries were due to their production structure, namely their specialization in a narrow range of primary commodities. Eh? Many economists that uh, were just that uh, specializing in one thing, you know, I mean, not even a few things. Eh? And yeah, and then there was uh, that uh, Krivish uh, Singer thesis, which argued that you know, primary commodities over time experience uh, relative uh, fall in relative prices vis-a-vis -vis manufacturing, and that uh, creates all kind of uh, macroeconomic problems. I'm not going to go into that, but uh, just to illustrate, you know, that this uh, differences in economic structure was uh, one reason why you needed a different kind of economics. Uh, for another example, many early development economists argue that you cannot use neoclassical theory to analyze the behavior of uh, small farmers or what were then the more typically called peasants in developing countries because these uh, the, the peasants do not, unlike the form in neo neoclassical economic theory, these uh, peasants do not maximize profit. Yeah? They might be playing a role similar to what are played by capitalist firms in the advanced economies upon whose behavior you have you know, built a whole range of theories about you know, production and market competition and so on. But people pointed out, look, uh, these peasants typically try to maximize the average consumption of their family members. And you cannot use a neoclassical theory of uh, profit maximizing firm but to analyze this. So the differences in the structure of land ownership and uh, the <coughs> family and so on basically made uh, standard neoclassical economics that are unapplicable to developing countries. So this uh, structuralist thinking was at the heart of uh, the birth of uh, development economics, but this got very heavily criticized since the 1970s with the increasing dominance of neoclassical economics. Now, from the, you know, neoclassical economics was uh, really born in the late 19th century. Yeah? You know, economics used to be called political economy. Yeah? Adam Smith never wrote anything on economics. Yeah? Well, I mean, apart from the fact that he was a professor of jurisprudence, he wrote books on political economy. You know, David Ricardo wrote on political economy. There was no such thing called economics. In the late 19th century, neoclassical economists said that, uh, well, a bunch of uh, economists came along and said, we need to make economics into science. Yeah? 
we need to get rid of uh, the things like politics in our study because it's not subject to scientific analysis. Eh? So the subject was uh, renamed economics and from those days uh, neoclassical economists <coughs> were very proud of uh, is, uh, their ability to provide what they thought were value-free parsimonious uh, theories that can be applied anywhere and anytime. Eh? So one typical pedagogic device in the teaching of neoclassical economics is a one-person economy called Robinson Crusoe. Eh? Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> not an economy in the standard sense, but, you know, that's where you apply these uh, the analytical tools. Eh? But that economics is supposed to be applicable to, I don't know, some people shopping in the Sainsbury's today in Britain, eh? or to subsistence farmers in Ghana, or to feudal manors in eh, medieval Europe. Eh? So the, basically the Underlying idea in the neoclassical economics is uh, that these uh, structures really do not matter. Because in the end, everywhere you look at it, there are people making rational economic decisions under conditions of uh, scarcity. They try to maximize uh, their utility. So it doesn't really matter whether it's at the 19th century that uh, Britain or 21st century that uh, Bangladesh, you know, the same theory can be applied anywhere. And this underlying view of uh, the, what economics is that existed uh, from the early days of uh, neoclassical economics that really got uh, fully applied in the real world in the 1980s and 1990s eh? in the form of the so-called structure adjustment program. So the World Bank and the IMF, I mean, how this uh, structure adjustment uh, program came into being and all that is uh, another story, but basically in the 1980s and 90s, the World Bank and the IMF applied this very homogeneous, narrow set of uh, policies, trade liberalization, <coughs> privatization of uh, state-owned enterprises, deregulation of the economy, macroeconomic uh, stabilization, they apply the same set of policies to all developing countries they were borrowing, uh, the, uh, which were borrowing money from them. Yeah? And when some people concerned, uh, the, the, uh, sorry, the expressed their concerns uh, that, well, actually these countries have different structures and maybe you cannot apply the same policy to different countries. The response uh, from the World Bank and the IMF and the mainstream economists who were supporting them was, no, actually, you, know, the, you are getting this completely wrong. Yeah? There's only one correct economic theory called neoclassical economics. Yeah? And that gives us one, only one correct set of policies. Yeah? What is right policy in Ghana is the right policy in Germany, right policy in Bolivia. Yeah? Yeah, so in those days, uh, people who were talking about, you know, things like history, politics, institutions, you know, trying to argue that you can apply the same policies to different countries, were criticized for being woolly you know, in their thinking. Oh, you are talking about those things because uh, you can handle, you know, hard stuff like mathematical models and, you know, uh, econometrics. You know? These things that uh, don't matter in the end. Eh? Yeah, so that this uh, belief in one true economic science and one correct set of policies was so strong that, you know, when I was a young kind of faculty member in those days, uh, you know, that we, we heard uh, a lot of uh, like horror stories. Yeah? I mean, I'm sure many of them are just urban legends, but. One story that, that, that uh, really stuck to my memory was that uh, an IMF economist was giving a presentation on what the country uh, should be doing in front of the Bolivian president. And then in page 32 of his PowerPoint, oops, he forgot to change Ecuador to Bolivia. 
Yeah, so they had basically the same template, yeah, change the country name, plug in different numbers, and voila. Yeah? I'm sure this was an urban legend, but you know, that was totally believable. Given the way yeah, the World Bank and the IMF economists were talking then, yeah, given the way the academic economists supporting them were talking then. Yeah. Now, unfortunately for the believers in the universal applicability of neoclassical economics, these structure adjustment programs miserably fail to produce the expected results of accelerated growth and macroeconomic stability. So if I show you some figures, you know, developing countries, of course, I mean, who is a developing country and so on, I mean, this over time has changed so that, that these numbers are not strictly comparable, but basically between 1955 and 80, when they were using all these uh, supposedly bad input substitution policies, you know, uh, different forms of state interventions, per capita income in those countries grew at about 3.1 percent per year, faster than the world average. Yeah? In the next uh, the, uh, three and a half decades, this uh, growth rate uh, <coughs> fell to 2.5 percent, and in some regions, this I mean, the economic growth basically collapsed. Yeah? And interestingly, these are the regions that were most uh, subject to the structural adjustment programs, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. You know, if you visit the uh, Latin American country, uh, well, I mean, today is uh, probably a bit less, but uh, visited the uh, Latin American countries in the 1990s, the 2000s, you know, you'd uh, the be bored to death uh, by the local economists uh, telling you about the bad old days of import substitution. Yeah? how it was all a disaster. You know. this, uh, this guy, Gustavo Franco, who was the governor of the Brazilian Central Bank in the late 90s, uh, once famously said that I'm here to do my job, which is to undo 40 years of stupidity. You know. But uh, the numbers tell a totally different story. You know. Because uh, the, the, the per capita income in Latin America used to grow in the 60s and 70s at 3.1 percent and in the next uh, 30 years this rate was uh, one quarter of that. Yeah? You know, Sub-Saharan Africa wasn't doing great uh, in the 60s and 70s but at least uh, per capita income was uh, growing at 1.6 percent. In the next 30 years it fell to 0.2 percent which means that in those uh, 30 years per capita income in the, the Sub-Saharan Africa grew by 6 percent. You know, China grows that much in six months in a good year. You know? And 30 years of uh, the structural adjustment program produced this. You know? I mean, if you actually focus on the 80s and 90s, when the, this uh, structural adjustment program was uh, implemented uh, very heavily, you, know, you are really talking about you know, Africa going backward. You know? So by the late 1990s, it became necessary to find explanations as to why all these good policies based on correct theories were not working. You know, when the, this uh, structure adjustment uh, programs didn't work in the beginning, the IMF and the World Bank say, oh, we need more time. You know. That, that these are pretty serious things. Uh, you cannot expect result in two, three years. Although in the beginning, that's not what they said. They said, do this in six months, you will revive your economy. Yeah, so it, uh, they had a few more years and then nothing was happening. Actually, things were going backwards. So they started blaming the local. Yeah? Oh, they are not uh, implementing this seriously. Yeah? We need to make them do more, yeah? faster. Yeah? And then uh, it still didn't work. So why? Some explanation had to be found. So as a result, in the late 1990s, a whole series of arguments emerged 
that try to explain the continued poor performance of orthodox economic policies with the help of what I call meta-structural factors that had until then been considered beyond the domain of economics or even beneath the economic. So suddenly you saw the explosion of this literature talking about things like geography, climate, culture, natural resources, yeah? institutions, history. It's quite amazing how in the late 90s and 2000s there was an explosion of this uh, literature. I'll uh, talk about them in detail later. I call these uh, factors meta-structural in the sense that these are things that are really beyond human intervention. So structural, yes, uh, if uh, the specialization in a narrow range of uh, primary commodities is a problem, not immediately, but over time you can do something about it by industrialization or at least diversification within the primary commodity sector like uh, Chile has done. Yeah? But when it comes to geography or you know, history, you, know, you, you cannot change these things. Yeah? Now, if you seriously believe that it is the climate or the culture or geography that is holding back these countries, then impl uh, the implication is that some countries are destined for underdevelopment. Yeah, because if you seriously believe that geography is a problem, what is the policy implication? I don't know, Uganda has to invade Norway and move the country. No, seriously, I mean, that, that what else can you do? Hmm? If you believe that, 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 that culture is a problem, what do you do? I mean, that, do you set up a re-education camp like the Khmer Rouge and try to brainwash everyone? No, no really, I mean, the implications are very disturbing. Hmm? Anyway, luckily, these things are not as important as you think. Hmm? Actually, it's more than that, but I'll leave it at that at the moment. And first, uh, to examine these arguments uh, individually. So, the list is very impressive. I mean, people have talked about tropical climate, which creates uh, the tropical diseases, especially malaria, that reduce labor productivity, raise healthcare costs, reduce animal husbandry yields because uh, the, these countries also have like uh, the diseases that, uh, for cattle and so on that are very difficult to deal with. Some have argued that although this is disputed, tropical soil leads to low agriculture yields. And it's uh, not just in terms of kind of the agriculture but in terms of institutions that uh, trop tropical climate has been blamed because Asimoglu, well, my Turkish friends tell me that he, he should be read as Ajimoglu, but uh, that's what other people say, so I'll call him Asimoglu. You know, after all, my name Chang is pronounced in Korea as Chang, so you know, doing it to myself as well, so the, Anyway, Asimoglu and so on uh, have this uh, famous paper in American Economic Review 2001 in which uh, basically they argued uh, for this uh, indirect link between climate and economic development. How? They basically argued that the prevalence of tropical diseases discouraged colonial settlements by the Europeans in countries close to the equator. So basically the story is that, that, that when the colonized land was kind of nice and where Europeans that, uh, wanted to live, like the US or New Zealand, yeah? they brought proper institutions, yeah? proper to rise, democracy, what have you. Yeah? When the colonized land was hot and full of diseases, they just wanted to get in and extract resources and get out. So they brought bad institutions. Yeah? And according to them, these institutions stuck. Yeah? 
So actually, they are finding through very questionable that, that uh, series of econometric exercise, finding correlation between the quality of institutions that were there 500 years ago in the early days of uh, colonization to the quality of institutions today. Yeah? So basically, the, 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 the fate of these countries was set yeah, when they forgot to migrate out of Africa, yeah, so to speak. Yeah? Geography, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, and others have uh, argued that uh, is a major determinant of uh, economic performance. First of all, they point out that landlocked countries are disadvantaged in economic development because this uh, restricts uh, the opportunity to trade with the outside world. Huh? People have also talked about the, the, what is known as bad neighborhood effect. If you are in a region which is full of poor and conflict within countries, like many African countries are, then you cannot develop. Yeah? Because you have uh, limited trading opportunities because your neighbors are poor. Even if you don't have the conflicts, conflicts uh, from neighboring countries spill over into you. And this is a major problem uh, that for, for development. Jeffrey Sachs, Andrew Warner, other people have uh, talked about the so-called natural resource curse. If you are, are abundant in natural resources, it leads to corruption, conflicts, overvaluation of currency, weak linkages uh, with the rest of the economy, so basically you are disadvantaged in the economic uh, development. Paul Collier, William Easterly, and others have uh, talked about ethnic diversity being a problem. Basically the argument is a high ethnic diversity makes uh, people trust, uh, distrust each other, raising transaction costs, making markets function less well, People have also argued that, especially if uh, there are a few groups of similar strength, ethnic diversity can encourage violent conflicts. So ethnic diversity is uh, not good for economic development. You know, all of these things have been proven yeah, by the, the use of econometrics. Yeah? I mean, we can get into how reliable these are, but uh, you know, at least uh, that uh, ostensibly. You know, they regress, yeah? I mean, for example, the, the, this thing called ethno-linguistic divers, diversification, uh, diversity index to economic growth, yeah? Over 140 countries or whatever, yeah? So it's proven, yeah? Low quality institutions have been often blamed, especially by the World Bank, but also as we uh, already looked at, that, that, that by people like Asimoglu. So poor political governance and the absence of rule of law, weak property rights, these things have been blamed as a reason for uh, underdevelopment. David Landis, uh, the Harvard historian, Francis Fukuyama, the, Japanese American political scientist who became famous with this article on the end of history, Samuel Huntington, the author of the controversial book, uh, The Clash of Civilizations. These people have argued that culture is uh, what is uh, holding back the developing countries. Of course, these cultural arguments are often presented in a very convoluted way because uh, people don't want to be accused of racism. Yeah? Although today, I can totally see that, that, that people would uh, drop that inhibition and just uh, go for the jugular, but, you know. <laughs> so uh, sometimes it's uh, quite uh, difficult to figure out exactly what these people are saying, but uh, some of them have uh, put it rather strongly. Basically, you know, some cultures, especially the African or the Muslim ones, 
Yeah, so if you're an African Muslim, you are screwed, I guess. Yeah? <laughs> These cultures are supposed to be really bad for economic development. Yeah? You know, they, they lead to poor work ethic, they make people waste money rather than save, they make people uh, kind of uncooperative with each other, you know, they put that, that, uh, make people put low va uh, value on education, they make uh, people kind of uh, unable to plan for the future. So let me give you some quotes. Uh, this is uh, from Huntington and yeah, this is beautiful. I mean, he doesn't have any inhibition. So you know, basically, what is he saying? He said, you know, commenting on the fact that uh, South Korea and Ghana had uh, similar levels of uh, income in the early 60s, actually is wrong. I mean, uh, Ghana was uh, twice richer than South Korea in 1961. Eh? But anyway, I mean, in the similar neighborhood, he says South Koreans succeeded because they valued thrift, investment, hard work, education. Ghanaians had different values. Yeah? Basically, they were useless. Yeah? <laughs> and it's uh, not just uh, the, the, the Westerners who say this. You know, the, there's this you know, book uh, called Culture Matters, uh, edited by Samuel Huntington, in which uh, this uh, Cameroonian uh, businessman and author, uh, Daniel Etunga Mangele has uh, this uh, you know, beautiful quote. Yeah, yeah so that basically in this quote, that, uh, he argues that you know, Africans are basically backward looking. They don't have a concept of future. They don't plan. This is their problem. You know, in another, he likens uh, African societies to football teams in which uh, no one is uh, going to pass the ball to each other. You know, uh, why do you need uh, Western races when your own people say these things? Eh? <laughs> so there's this huge range of argument yeah, backed up by many Learned uh, articles uh, published in top journals, you know, American Economic Review, you know, you know what have you, which uh, the, the basically try to argue that the problems of <coughs> developing countries is that, yeah, basically they are you know, destined for underdevelopment. They're in the wrong place, they have the wrong culture, you know, wrong institutions. Now, it would be silly to argue that the above mentioned meta structure factors do not matter at all, because they do. But, first of all, <coughs> as I mentioned earlier, even if these arguments are right. What are the you know, about policy implications? Yeah? You know, other than I don't know, inventing a time machine, yeah? or some country in the tropics are invading yeah? Norway or Canada, it might be too difficult to invade the, the, the bigger countries. But you know, I, I think uh, Norway and Canada are quite good yeah? targets. <laughs> No, seriously, I mean, uh, well, I mean, one policy implication that has been derived is uh, that uh, from these by Jeffrey Sachs is that basically you have to treat, especially African countries, as equivalent to someone who's on a permanent disability benefit. Yeah, yeah that's his basis for foreign aid. Yeah? Secondly, as I'll show you now, Many of these arguments are not even you know, half right. You know? Let me show you why I say that. So first of all, climate. You know, when people discuss climate, it is implicitly assumed that it is only tropical climate that is harmful for economic development. The frigid and arctic climate that affect many developed countries like 
Canada, US, Finland, Sweden, Norway, or some of the <coughs> developing countries like uh, Russia, Mongolia, and so on. These climates are also very bad for economic development. You know, I mean, that, uh, in that those countries, I mean, except for a few kind of uh, late spring and summer months, uh, you know, you have to spend huge amount of money heating places, you know, people cannot work outside for long, you know, machines seize up, you know, the lubricants that, that, that freeze, you know? transportation is uh, blocked by snow and ice. You know, it's a uh, uh, very harsh environment. Hmm? Indeed, there's no obvious a priori reason to believe that cold climate is uh, better than hot climate for economic development. And I have the uh, world's uh, greatest uh, philosopher to back me in saying that, Aristotle. Hmm? So he had this view that Asians, well, uh, in his uh, the world, Asia is uh, basically today's uh, Middle East. Yeah? Asians live in hot places. Yeah? This makes them uh, clever, but very devious and cowardly and so on. Yeah? Europeans are living in cold places. This makes them uh, brave and honest and so on, but stupid. <laughs> and you have this view that uh, Greece has the perfect climate. Yeah? Not too hot, not too cold. Greeks have uh, both virtues. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, honest and clever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so actually, I uh, don't think uh, that uh, tropical climate is actually necessarily more hostile for economic development than this uh, the, the Arctic frigid climate. Yeah? Now, the point is that. <laughs> You know, we don't even think of cold climate in countries like Finland or the Canada as inhibiting factor, uh, uh, as an inhibiting factor when it comes to the economic development. Not because they don't have those climates, those hostile climates, but because they have acquired the money and the technologies to deal with this. Eh? Many rich countries have also had uh, tropical diseases, you know, not to speak of Singapore, which is uh, bang on the equator. You know, South Korea, Japan, Southern US, Southern Italy, they all had malaria. Eh? Well, they still do. But no one talks about the you know, problem with uh, malaria in the US or the Korea, not because they are not there, not because the climate is uh, the hostile to malaria, but because these countries have acquired the money and technology to provide better sanitation and better medical care for those uh, few lucky, uh, uh, sorry, unlucky people who uh, catch that. Yeah? So basically, the, my view is that the advocates of this uh, climate argument are confusing the cause and the symptoms of underdevelopment. A country's inability to overcome the constraints imposed by its poor climate, whether it's tropical or arctic, is a symptom of underdevelopment. The climate is not the cause of underdevelopment. You can uh, uh, say similar things about uh, geography too, you know. First of all, think about the, the landlockedness, yeah? You know, several rich countries are landlocked. The two most famous ones are being Switzerland and Austria. Scandinavian countries, until the early 20th century, when these ice-breaking ships that, that became common, were effectively landlocked for half the year because they climate is so cold that the sea freezes over. So basically for six months they were landlocked. But if being landlocked is such a burden, how did these countries develop?
Also, experiences of uh, individual developing countries defy this theory. The two fastest uh, growing economies in Africa at the moment, Ethiopia and Rwanda, they are both landlocked. Hmm? Ethiopia is actually even more amazing because it uh, started growing faster after it became landlocked. It didn't used to be landlocked until the early 90s when the coastal part, known as Eritrea, seceded in after this war of independence. Yeah? Suddenly the country became landlocked, but after that it started growing faster. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, uh, be, that in between 2003 and 2014, per capita income in Ethiopia grew at 8.2% per year. This is basically China's rate of growth. Yeah? So if being landlocked was uh, so bad, how come it uh, grew so fast. Yeah? Uzbekistan is even more interesting. This is the only country that is double landlocked in the world. Yeah? So you have to go through not just one country, but two countries to get to the sea. Well, technically, Liechtenstein is also a double landlocked, but it's a city with yeah, something like 80,000 people, so yeah, you cannot treat it as a country for this purpose. Yeah? Despite that, Uzbekistan has been the fastest growing former Soviet Republic, growing at 6.6% uh, per year in per capita terms in the first, say, 15 or so years of uh, the, the, the 21st century. And at that, by using very unorthodox policies. Still, a lot of protectionism, state ownership, and stuff like that. Well, the point here is that there are many alternatives to sea transport. Yeah? There's river, there's rail, there's road. Today, even air transport is uh, becoming quite important for export of certain things like flour, which uh, Ethiopia uh, exports a lot. And you can always that, uh, get linked to other countries' uh, transport system. Yeah? Ethiopia has been, since uh, the secession of Eritrea, has been using Djibouti as its uh, main port. Hmm? And of course, uh, you have to build a rail link and so on, but uh, that's what they did. Hmm? So all of this uh, suggests that, once again, these people are confusing the cause and the symptom. You know, it is the lack of investment in alternative transport systems rather than geography itself that is the problem. Similar points can be made uh, in relation to this uh, bad neighborhood effects. You know, this argument that if you are surrounded by poor countries, you cannot uh, develop through trade is uh, total nonsense. Yeah? You know, for example, South Korea grew mainly by exporting to the U.S. and Europe. I mean, Japan was the only country, the uh, only big country that you could trade with in the neighborhood because uh, in its fast-growth days, uh, the China was uh, communist. Uh, there was no trade at all between communist China and South Korea. North Korea, of course, uh, no trade. Yeah? So where do you export? Well, Japan was uh, also pretty protectionist at the time, so yeah, Koreans are uh, basically exported uh, to the U.S. Yeah, and to Europe. Yeah. I mean, why do you need uh, rich countries in the neighborhood yeah, to trade? Another interesting uh, the counter to the bad neighborhood effect is uh, India and Bangladesh. You know, people uh, often don't know this, uh, but S South Asia is uh, actually the poorest region in the world. Yeah? It's poorer than Sub-Saharan Africa in per capita income terms. Yeah? Despite that these two countries, if not all the countries in the region, have grown quite well in the last uh, couple of decades. And South Asia is uh, not a region which is uh, devoid of uh, social conflicts. Yeah? 
I mean, you all know about the military conflicts between India and Pakistan. You all know about Hindu-Muslim violence in India. You all know about the Tamil Sinhalese ethnic war in Sri Lanka. But there's also the famous uh, Maoist uh, guerrillas in India called the Naxalites, which had uh, control significant part of uh, Indian territory. In Nepal, there was uh, a 10-year civil war with the uh, Maoists uh, between 1996 and 2006. Yeah? So this region doesn't lack uh, the, the conflicts. Yeah? Despite all this, the poorest region in the world, lots of conflicts, these countries have done uh, quite well. Yeah? Gosh, I'm running out of time. But natural resources, well, basically the, the one main point that I need to make here is that natural resource endowment is often measured in the wrong way because uh, the, when people say such and such countries well endowed with natural resources, they tend to look at the share of natural resources in export or GDP. But actually, the high share of natural resources in GDP is largely, although not entirely, sign of underdevelopment. When South Korea was uh, underdeveloped in the early 1960s, 85% of its uh, export was natural resources. Yeah? But the country has such few natural resources, it uh, had a uh, per capita income of $90, yeah? less than half that of Ghana. Yeah? Yeah, so if you look at this uh, the, the kind of GDP or export indicators, you are going to confuse uh, the, the symptom of underdevelopment, namely high dependence on primary commodities, with cause of underdevelopment, according to this theory, natural resource curse. Yeah? So if you look at endowment statistics, if you actually look at the objective indicators of how much mineral deposit a country has and so on, only a few countries uh, in, for example, Africa have rich natural resource endowment. Yeah? Basically, South Africa and the Democratic Republic of Congo, followed by a handful of oil producing countries like Angola, Gabon, and Equatorial Guinea. But most other African countries do not have uh, much natural resource endowment. Many rich countries have uh, successfully used uh, natural resource abundance as uh, springboards uh, for the economic development, US, Canada, Australia, the Scandinavian countries, indeed, in the late 19th, early 20th century, the fastest growing regions were resource-rich areas like North America, Latin America, and Scandinavia. Ethnic diversity, well, many of today's rich countries in Europe have suffered from ethnic and other divisions, linguistic, religious, ideological, and what have you. And many of them have suffered from medium degree diversity, namely a few rather than numerous groups that are supposed to be, uh, that is uh, supposed to be the most conducive to violent conflicts according to people like uh, Isle. Hmm? As you all know, Belgium has two, well, and a bit if you count the tiny German speaking minority ethnic groups, Switzerland has uh, four languages and two religions and has experienced a number of mainly religion-based civil wars between mid-17th century and mid-19th century. They had no less than four civil wars uh, during that 200-year uh, period. Mm? And, uh, Spain has uh, serious uh, minority problems with the Catalans and the Basques. Uh, the, I was in the toilet downstairs, uh, someone in front of uh, my urinal in red pen wrote Catalonia. Huh? It's uh, still that alive. Yeah? The examples can go on. Yeah? East Asia is uh, not as homogeneous as uh, it is often thought. You know, of course, I know that uh, we all look the same. You know, I mean, Koreans, Chinese, you know, all Koreans look the same. All Koreans uh, look like the Chinese. You know. Yeah, but you know, the, to return the compliment, uh, Koreans are called all Caucasians Americans. So. <laughs> you know, Taiwan, you know, 
yeah, I mean, all Taiwanese are Chinese, but you know, it has a serious ethnic division because that, that, well, the original Taiwanese people are actually Polynesians. Uh, that there's still a very small number left uh, called Kaohsiung people who have been very badly treated, but the majority of Taiwanese population are basically descendants of uh, the people who emigrated from Southeast uh, China, especially Fujian province, in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. And then a much smaller group are the so-called mainlanders, uh, the northerners, who came with the Nationalist Party government when it was defeated by the Communist Party in 1949. And these two groups hate each other. Yeah? They speak languages that, uh, which are not mutually understandable verbally, even though they use the same you know, Chinese characters. You know, Japan has uh, serious uh, minority problems with the Koreans, the Okinawans, the Ainus, even though these are small in number. I mean, it's got the serious problem there. Yeah, Korea is uh, one of the most ethno-linguistically homogeneous countries in the world, but who says that being similar makes you like other people more? No, just think about your own family. Eh? <laughs> no, Korea has uh, this uh, very deep uh, regional divisions. Eh? I mean, especially there are these uh, two regions, one in the southwest and uh, one in the southeast. I mean, uh, their relationships that are much better these days, but uh, in the 80s and 90s, I mean, they hated uh, each other so much that people would uh, not allow their children to marry someone simply because uh, the prospective partner is from the other side. Yeah? Oh, he's from there? No, no way. Yeah? You have to kill me first. Yeah? Yeah, so this uh, fantasy that it's only African countries yeah, that uh, suffer from this ethnic diversity is yeah, I mean, that, uh, completely unacceptable. Yeah? In the African context, uh, the interesting contrast uh, comes uh, when you look at Rwanda and Tanzania. You know, Rwanda actually, according to this uh, ethno-linguistic fractionalization, yeah, that I just remember that word, uh, the statistics that uh, people like Easterly use in their studies is one of the most homogeneous societies in the world, together with South Korea. Despite that, they had that famous genocide in 1994. Because the Belgians, in order to facilitate their colonial rules, created this artificial division between the Hutus and the Tutsis. I mean, I'm not saying that it was baseless, but they promoted this idea that one group is superior to Another, and then it uh, the, kind of unfolded in the most uh, horrendous way. Yeah? Tanzania, in contrast, is uh, biologically speaking the most diverse nation in the world. Yeah? It has the highest level of genetic diversity in the world, but it has managed to create this uh, sense of national identity. Yeah? Yeah, so if you meet a Maasai from Kenya, say, he will usually say, I'm a Maasai and I'm from Kenya. But when you meet a Maasai from Tanzania, he will usually say, I'm a Tanzanian and I'm a Maasai. I mean, this is a kind of anecdotal evidence, but you know, nations are basically what you build. They are not natural. They are not, you know, I mean, all these uh, notions of ethnicity, ethnicity, race, nationhood, I mean, these are political and social constructions. So once again, rich countries do not seem to suffer from ethnic heterogeneity, not because they don't have it, but because they have succeeded in building a nation out of a heterogeneous population. You know, for example, there's this uh, very interesting book by, I think it's uh, the originally the uh, Romanian Jew, but uh, the, this American historian called Eugene Weber called peasants into Frenchmen. And uh, he starts at, uh, his observation uh, book with this observation that uh, back in 1850, something like 40% of children in French schools didn't speak French. Yeah? They spoke a related language, but you know, there was no idea of France. Yeah? 
as we think about it in modern day terms. Yeah? It was only through decades of you know, military conscriptions, you know, standardized curriculums, you know, uh, spread of newspapers and political propaganda that, that they created this uh, identity called a Frenchman you know, out of this very diverse you know, stock of uh, peasants. You know? Anyway, institutions, well, I, I mean, this is a big subject on its own, so I'm not going to go into that, but the, basically the, the, the point I want to make here is, yes, I mean, institutions matter. It affects uh, economic development, but uh, you have to understand that this is a two-way causation. Yeah? Economic development changes institutions yeah? because it creates, say, demands uh, for better institutions. Yeah? And more democracy, more transparency. It makes that, that these institutions are affordable. You know, all these institutions are quite ex expensive to implement. You need you know, the legal system, uh, police, and uh, inspectorates, what have you. Poor countries often you know, do not have resources to do that. And economic development creates uh, new agents of change, demanding new institutions. So, for example, Capitalists uh, supported the development of banking institutions against the land laws in this country in the 18th century, while uh, also the workers agitated for welfare state and protected labor laws against capitalists in the late 19th, early 20th century. So basically, you know, you have to understand this uh, two-way causation. Yeah? So very often, the low quality institutions you see are the consequences of lack of the development, not the cause of the, uh, the lack of development. Well, I can talk about this more if you want, but uh, let's uh, that, uh, finally move on to the cultural argument. <coughs> and actually, uh, if you go back to some historical sources, many of today's rich countries, when they were poor, used to be criticized for having all those negative cultural traits that are supposed to characterize poorly performing economies today. So let me give you a few examples. You know, the, when Germany was a poor country, the British would go to Germany and say basically Germans are stupid and lazy. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is actually one of the kinder kind of uh, descriptions. Yeah? No, I mean, it's uh, almost shocking uh, because uh, the way they describe the Germans uh, at the time are uh, almost the polar opposite of the stereotypical image of Germans that the British people have today. Yeah? I mean, instead of being rational, these are overly emotional people. Yeah? Instead of being too kind of organized and totalitarian, yeah? these are people who cannot cooperate with each other. Yeah? Is that the, the, the law abiding and honest? Uh, these are thieves. Yeah? They never keep time. Yeah? I mean, that's what the, the, uh, Mary Shelley, the author of uh, Frankenstein, said yeah? Germans never hurry. Yeah? An Australian engineer, after visiting Japan at the invitation of the Japanese government who wanted him to improve, uh, advice. Uh, them uh, to uh, advise it to improve productivity in Japanese factories. This is uh, the conclusion that uh, he came up with. Yeah? Well, not in so many words. Basically, he was saying your workers are lazy bastards. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they are paid very cheaply, but you know, they don't work. Yeah? And when I put to this uh, to the managers, they say, oh, this is a habit of national heritage. Yeah? So the Japanese themselves at the time thought Japanese were lazy. Yeah? And finally, the crown in the jewel of this uh, historical quotes is uh, some, something that was said about my own ancestors. And I think that this is one of the rudest things that have ever been said about anyone. This is uh, no less than Beatrice Webb, yeah? the supposed uh, that, 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 uh, kind of uh, feminist, proto-feminist and the uh, uh, leader of Fabian Socialism, calling my ancestors 
dirty, degraded, sullen, lazy, and religionless savages. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, and uh, the obligatory mud huts uh, come up, you know. This is where all the poor people are supposed to live. You know, I mean, I can give you more. Uh, <laughs> but you get the point, yeah? Actually, the, there are some juicy quotes uh, in chapter 9 of uh, my earlier book, Bad Samaritans, where I talk about the culture and development. So, yeah, if you want to abuse your German friends or Japanese friends, uh, the, <laughs> there's your chance, huh? Of course, that, you know, the cultures of these countries today are completely different. Huh? And then you have people like Samuel Huntington who say, oh, Koreans, uh, the, the Korea developed because Koreans have this hard work ethic and yeah, uh, the, the, they saved a lot and, you know. Which is right. I mean, of course, uh, both is right. Yeah? The point is that cultures are not given. They are subject to changes. Yeah? Sometimes uh, the, by deliberate uh, manipulation, but very often it changes because of economic development. You know, for example, the, the until say 20 years ago, there was this expression in Korea, probably the younger generation the, of Koreans haven't even heard of it. Yeah? Called the Korean time, yeah? which means that you could be late for your appointment for uh, maybe up to an hour and a half, and you don't have to apologize, yeah? because that's what people do all the time. Yeah? Today, the expression doesn't even exist, yeah? because time has become more expensive in relative terms. Yeah? Everyone has more money, but time is limited. Yeah? You know, everyone's that uh, living in highly organized uh, society, you know. And if you are, I don't know, working in an agricultural environment, you know, hey, you, you got up, I don't know, half an hour late because you had a bit too much to drink uh, last night. You go to your field half an, hour, uh, half an hour late, you come back half an hour later. Huh? No big deal. But if you're working on a production line, yeah, if you're working in the stock market, you have to be there at 8.45. Yeah? Otherwise, that, that the whole thing uh, would collapse. Yeah? So industrial societies distill this idea of timekeeping into people. Yeah? yeah, so Germans used to be unable to keep time. Yeah? They never hurried. Yeah? They had no sense of time yeah? before they industrialized. Yeah, yeah so that... Uh, once again, this cultural argument, so-called, are confusing the causes and symptoms of underdevelopment. Yeah? These countries have, of course, in these descriptions, there's a huge amount of uh, you know, racism and cultural prejudice, but these countries have this uh, negative trait, negative cultural trait, exactly because they are underdeveloped. Yeah? Not because, uh, it's not that, they are underdeveloped because of these uh, negative traits. Yeah? So, to conclude, argument citing all these non policy factors, what I call the ABP arguments, that uh, do not change over time, such as uh, climate, geography, and other meta structural factors cannot explain how the economic performances of the countries in question have uh, fluctuated a lot since the world, uh, Second World War. Yeah? So in the 60s and 70s, per capita income in Africa was growing at around 1.5%. In the next uh, 20 uh, the years, it was like uh, minus 1.5%. Uh, in the following, uh, the, the, sorry, next 30 years, yeah? in the following uh, the 10, 15 years, it uh, went up to 2%. If it was uh, because of climate and geography and these things that do not change, how do you explain this uh, fluctuation? Yeah? Except yeah, by saying that different policies were applied and they produce different results. The effects of these factors are often characterized in a biased way. So, for example, 
when people talk about the, the resource cars, they never talk about the potential positive effects of having lots of natural resources. Huh? In the long run, some of the allegedly unalterable metastructure factors are actually subject to change through human intervention, both directly and indirectly. Yeah? So things like culture can change, yeah? it has changed. Finally, many of the factors uh, that are touted as uh, reasons for underdevelopment in the, today's developing countries were present and sometimes, uh, there's something missing there, yeah, sometimes still are present in the rich countries but do not matter much anymore because those countries have acquired the abilities to deal with them largely thanks to economic development. So these considerations, to sum up, makes me conclude that while certain aspects of these arguments have some validity, these AVP arguments have largely served as excuses for the failure of orthodox economic policies. And by presenting these as uh, explanations of underdevelopment, those who have uh, made these arguments have actually prevented us from understanding the role of these uh, factors properly. Yeah? Once again, you know, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that these things do not matter, but if you present them in this kind of way, you actually cannot really understand how and exactly how the, 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 these things matter. So more balanced and nuanced look at the mechanisms that through which these non-policy factors, meta-structural factors affect economic performance, as well as the reverse causality is needed if you are to save some of the valid ideas that contain these arguments while not succumbing to the undue fatalism that some countries are simply destined to remain underdeveloped. Thank you very much.